TNA Sacrifice 2014. One of the first thing that Tanae and Taz talk about is the fact that they had to turn away people from a free attraction at an amusement park. I said, oh God, it's going to be one of these nights, isn't it? And let's be realistic here. TNA was trying to sit there and actually charge full pay-per-view price for this. And I can't remember, frankly, the last time I was so uninterested or so lacking in excitement for a pay-per-view from either a WWE or a TNA. This was bad. In fact, I had to remind myself Sunday morning that there even was a TNA pay-per-view come Sunday night. And TNA was actually expecting people to fork over 40 plus bucks to watch the damn show. And you could even check on social media as the show was going on. There was almost nobody talking about it. And that's sad. And frankly, sacrifice is one of those kind of sad pay-per-views in a way. One thing TNA is notorious for over the years is the overuse of stipulations, and stipulations that don't make any fucking sense. And I look at the opening tag match, your tag title match. The bromance have gotten off via DQs and countouts and not showing up. Everything they could possibly do to keep the belts off of the Wolves. So now you get to sacrifice here. This match kicks off the show, and we do a bunch of things that would actually favor the heels. We make it a three-on-two tag match and make it no disqualification. To me, a more sensible stipulation would be that if the bromance got DQ'd or if they got counted out, that the Wolves would win the tag team titles. That way they had nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. So if you've given them a man advantage and given them the no disqualification stipulation, why instantly, once this match started, would the bromance not go find every weapon available known to man and take out... Richards and freaking Edwards. Why would they not do that? Based off of the stipulations. But of course, this is TNA, and a lot of the things that TNA does makes absolutely no fucking sense, especially when it comes to the overuse of stipulations in their matches, of which you got plenty evidence of that on this show. However, this match was a good opener. The Wolves won. Thank God. They're the new TNA Tag Champions. Thank God. So, second match on the card, and another stipulation, this time a committed match, where in order to win the match, you had to put your opponent in a padded van and send them off to the funny farm. And oh my god, this feud between Samuel Shaw and Mr. Anderson feels like it belongs on the funny farm in so many different ways. It's awkward and out there. Um, the matches between these guys have been slow and incredibly lumbering and really struggling to get get you know any type of real energy level to it but the funny thing is about this whole feud and even this match here is as awkward and out there as it is and as stupid as it might be and as slow and lumbering as the matches might be and how predictable the outcomes might be it's so off the wall it's so unique and it's so different compared to anything else maybe in professional wrestling right now that it works and it resonates and it gets over. Fuck if I know sometimes. Fuck if I know. But hey, it is what it is. I mean, now I'm just wondering, you know, should Shaw have actually lost this feud? Maybe he should have actually won. Uh, next question is, what's going to happen to Shaw after this now that he lost this match and they sent him off to the funny farm? I don't know. But I actually want to see what happens. I hope this isn't just them getting away from the Shaw character and we're not going to see him for several months. Um, because I'm actually starting to like the creepy bastard quite a bit. EC3 and Rockstar Spud are one of my reasons to still be watching TNA. They're an incredibly entertaining duo, whether individually or especially together. But even they, to me, couldn't save this tag match with them going against Kurt Angle and Willow. Now, let me say this again for TNA's perspective. I understand part of the reason you do Willow is to do something different with Jeff Hardy, sell some more Hardy merch, and maybe that's why you want to remind people that Willow is Jeff Hardy. But I think people are at least hopefully smart enough to understand that Willow is Jeff Hardy. So maybe allow Willow a chance to be Willow and stop mentioning Jeff Hardy all the damn time. As far as this match, it definitely didn't feel like a pay-per-view match. It barely felt like an impact quality match. And I was kind of disappointed here, even though I had a feeling Rockstar Spud was in there just to eat the pinfall. Uh, why not just sit there and have EC3 get disqualified because he goes batshit on both Willow or Kurt Angle 
Um, or why not have Willow and Kurt Angle get disqualified because they want to sit there and go off on EC3? It just I don't know why TNA is always so obsessed with making most of, if not all of their heels, kind of cowardly chicken shits. You know, I don't get it. And this match just frankly really didn't work for me. Now we got the culmination to this best out of three X Division Championship Series that, like I said admittedly until a couple weeks ago, I didn't even know there was a best of three series. And no, that's not my fault. That's TNA's fault for not doing a better job of promoting that and mentioning that and letting me know and other people know that that was the case. So stop blaming me. Maybe it's time for some of you knuckleheads out there to start blaming TNA for some of the stupid shit that they do. However... I had a great appreciation for the fact that the X Division title match didn't kick off the show. In fact, it was right smack dab in the middle of the card. And I'm perfectly fine with that. I thought that was a good thing. This was a good match on this show. You know, and I look at Sonata and I see a guy, and I have an appreciation for the fact that um, TNA is not trying to make him a joke. And they're not just trying to make him some uh, World War II Tojo type of heel. They're actually trying to make him a baby face, and I like that. I, I laughed at the Goku chants. I thought that was pretty funny during the match. Uh, but this match here between Sonata and Tigre Uno is what you would expect out of an X Division match. A lot of bumping around, a lot of no-selling. One minute Sonata's pointing at his neck like he's got a stinger or something because Tigre Uno is fucking injuring him all over the damn place. And then the next minute he's running around and doing shit with his shoulder like nothing's happening. I'm like, this is the X Division. It's not about weight limits. It's about no limits. It's about no-selling. This is fucking awesome. This is a good match. Sonata wins. I wonder who's going to be next. In terms of X Division title feuds for him, hopefully it'll be Kenny King. But a good match on this card. Nothing to really complain about here. When I said I wasn't that excited heading into this pay-per-view, that is very true. I, like I said before, I can't remember the last time I was less interested in a pay-per-view from a TNA or a WWE, frankly. I've seen a lot of poor build-ups and a lot of filler shows. But this one kind of took the cake. However, there was one match on this card that I was anxiously anticipating and couldn't wait to see because it's the best feud this company's had in quite a while. It was guaranteed to me to be the match of the night again, and it ended up being that. And that is James Storm versus Gunner in this I Quit match. Now, in a pay-per-view filled with stipulation matches, at least you could say with this stipulation, it made sense. This had a long story to it. It had a long build to it. And this was a perfect kind of way to cap off and end this feud. This match was really good. Told a really good story. Gunner goes over. No big complaints, except for one small thing, maybe. Maybe James Storm should have won a big match along the way. Just maybe. But I did like the fact how... When you got to the finish and you got to Gunner sitting there and holding James Storm after James Storm for some reason didn't want to sell three of those Hangar 18s the right way for whatever damn reason. You got Gunner there holding the kind of glass shard like he's going to shank him or something. He's telling James Storm he's going to do it if he doesn't say I quit. And as James Storm is getting ready to say I quit, Gunner actually follows through and starts poking at him with the glass shard. I'm like, yes! This is the type of shit we don't get from a WWE. This is the type of shit that a TNA should be giving us. Going more extreme. Doing this type of stuff. Going to a different level in terms of the person, personal touches on their storylines. A guy like Gunner should be this pissed off. Storms fucked with him. Cost him the title. Fucked up his dad. He should be wanting to stab him. That's like what we would do in real life. Sometimes it's those simple touches... But those easy touches that are so often missed that make all the difference in the world. And to me, that really brought home this match and really was the perfect kind of cap on this feud. One thing I talk about consistently with this company and a problem that they have is the overuse of stipulations and in particular the overuse of stipulations that don't make any damn sense. They're just random and thrown out there. A Russo touch if there ever was one. However, even though this pay-per-view had three other kind of special stipulation matches, the fourth stipulation match, the tables match, did make a lot of sense between a Bobby Roode and a Bully Ray. And I've actually been a fan of this feud, and I've been a fan in particular of the way that Bobby Roode is being featured as a strong and alpha male type of heel that isn't afraid. He's not going to bow down. He's going to try and take on Bully Ray in his fucking game. And I love that. But then, of course, we get the actual match itself. And it just, to me, perfectly crystallizes and embodies so many things 
about TNA, and in particular, so many things that are wrong with TNA. First of all, you have the overuse of stipulations. Yes, there was story to this. Yes, there was reason for it. But at the end of the day, you had already had three other matches on this fucking card that had some type of stipulation. So, of course, we get a fourth one here. You got Bully Ray featured in a semi-main event spot yet again. Imagine that. Then you get the ref bump of the ages. Here goes Bobby Roode about to be put in through a table by Bully Ray. Gets ready to bully bomb him. And fucking the ref doesn't even get hit by Bobby Roode. The ref had one fucking job in this match. He had one thing to do. He had one bump to take. One spot to nail correctly. And he fucked it up miserably. <laughs> this is worse than Batista laughing and bouncing back. <laughs> no selling for Mark Henry. <laughs> Bobby Roode's feet go flying up to get into the powerbomb position. The ref is like this far away. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh, oh, oh shit, I better fall. <laughs> And then he's out for several fucking minutes, even though nobody fucking touched him. And the great touch on this all, of course, in typical TNA fashion, they actually bothered to try and show the replay. And they tried to mask the fact that the referee didn't get touched, that the referee screwed up his one job in this match, the one spot he had to get right, the one fucking bump he had to take. This is typical TNA, but oh, it got better. Then only TNA would have a fucking screw job in a fucking tables match. And of all people, it's fucking Dixie Carter dressed up like one of the ring crew wearing a fucking beard. Dixie Carter helps Bobby Roode win. The same Bobby Roode that she made captain of her team at lockdown that lost the match. That lost her day-to-day -day control of the operations of TNA. Now she's helping Bobby Roode still, even though he lost this. Because she wants to get at Bully Ray. And she's wearing a fuck... Oh my god. I don't even know what more to say. It just... Crystallizes so many things that are TNA. Overuse of stipulations. Horribly botched ref bumps. And freaking screw jobs and stipulation matches involving the almost 50 year old female owner of the goddamn company. Dressed up in a fucking beard. Maybe she did invent the beard. Oh Christ. <laughs> DNA. <laughs> He's the rough guy hit by nothing and he sold it for several fucking minutes like he got clocked. The stupidity of that tables match was just too much, apparently, for my system to take. Because after that tables match, I checked out. I went to sleep. I can't remember the last time I went to sleep during a pay-per-view. I cannot remember the last time that I missed the main event of a pay-per-view. Whether that's WWE, TNA, ECW, WCW. That's how bad it's gotten to me with TNA. They had me so uninterested in this pay-per-view heading into it. And then they do stupid shit like that tables match. I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I got better things to do. I'm going to bed. I'll watch this main event the next day. It's that bad. And I think about it this way. This main event, it kind of represents so many things that are wrong with TNA too. Because instead of doing something that you had spent several months building up to at lockdown and having Joe win the title and bringing back maybe some disenfranchised former TNA fans and actually being ahead of the curve and doing something before WWE actually does it and actually capitalizing on the fact that WWE was positioning themselves in a way that a lot of fans were getting upset because they were afraid that Daniel Bryan wasn't going to win the belt at WrestleMania 30. Here you go with Samoa Joe, one of your guys for many years. You've got the chance to do it right. And, of course, they wait until after the WWE does their thing with Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 30 to decide, ah, we're going to be typical TNA, we're going to be reactionary, not proactive, and we're going to sit there and hot shot Eric Young to the title. And no, 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 not even bother building up to it at all. Not even wait to the goddamn pay-per-view that we're expecting people to pay 40-plus bucks for. We're going to sit there and hot shot it in one night of television on Impact. Magnus versus Eric Young was the main event of a pay-per-view. Yep. Was this match main event pay-per-view quality? Nope. Was this match 
impact main event quality? Maybe? Barely? Oh, God. This just right here just embodies so many differences between WWE and TNA, even as flawed of an animal as WWE is today. And make no mistake about it, they are. And they still are. And no matter how much people and idiots try to think that WWE is so different, so many of their damn things are exactly the same. And they're exactly the same problems that were there three, four, five years ago. However, TNA just does it to a whole different level of suck sometimes. And this here, Eric Young, you were more focused on Magnus and Abyss than you were on Magnus and Eric Young. There still isn't really a fucking feud here. There still really isn't much of a story here. And instead of waiting to the pay-per-view to give Eric Young this moment, give him this night, and actually maybe give something to the people to, that actually paid the 40-plus bucks to watch the pay-per-view, he just sat there and hot-shotted it on television a couple weeks ago and barely even built up to this heading into the damn pay-per-view. If that isn't typical TNA, I don't know what the fuck is. 